PCN is brought to you in part by the following underwriters. It's warming up, and so are the activities in our communities. Welcome to PCN. I'm Julie Thompson. And I'm Larry King. Tonight we bring you the Pembroke Chamber of Commerce's Legislative Breakfast, and we hear about a new book from famous author Harper Lee. We'll bring you to the open mic finals at the Spire in Plymouth, and to a trash bash event in Kingston. And PCN brings us some spruce up tips with Design Corner and Town Talk. This week is from Kingston. It's going to be a great show, and we begin with the Lieutenant Governor visiting the Pine Hills last week. The Pine Hills in Plymouth was front and center for Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito as part of their plan to showcase the upscale village as a success story for housing and economic development, Pine Hills management invited the Lieutenant Governor to take a bus tour of the facility. PCN's Brian Sullivan was also on board and brought us this report. Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito paid a visit to the Pine Hills in Plymouth last week to take a tour of this rapidly growing village tucked away in the woods off of Clark Road. Several local dignitaries were there at her arrival to get a glimpse of, and possibly a word or two, with the state's second in command. Tony Green, one of the uh, I've heard of Pine Hills. so many good things about you. The purpose of the visit was to showcase the Pine Hills as a site for housing and economic development, two of the top items on the agenda for the Baker Polito administration. To get a first hand look, we took a trolley tour through a number of different areas in the village. The town made a decision to change the zoning here from one house for every three acres uh, to this mixed-use zoning that allows for housing at more density and much more density where we actually build it. It's almost ten times density where we build and yet it feels very private by the way in which we're able to take advantage of topography and vegetation. The Pine Hills development is looked at as a top economic driver for the town of Plymouth, thanks in large part to the $15 million generated annually in tax revenues. The only town resources used by residents are the police force and the fire department. The flip side to that coin is high fees and a $775,000 median cost for a home. Yet the residents don't seem to mind. For people living outside the community, it's possible to feel as if they're being priced out, while wealthier people from outside of Plymouth and even Massachusetts are moving in. Tony Green explains that it's not just all high-end housing in there. We have a variety of different neighborhoods. So there are 11 different home building companies that work here so that home buyers or renters have lots of different choices uh, as to the kind of place they might like to live. The lieutenant governor was met with plenty of friendly faces at the post tour cocktail party. It's safe to say she left very impressed by the whole experience. This is a great success story. It's a real credit to the leadership in Plymouth for recognizing that zoning changes would lead to this type of neighborhood. And the best part of this is when I asked, you know, what does Pine Hills mean to Plymouth? And they just said, this is the newest village in Plymouth. From the Pine Hills, I'm Brian Sullivan, PAC-TV Community News. The Pembroke Chamber of Commerce held its annual legislative breakfast at the historic Pembroke Historical Society Museum. PCN attended the event and a discussion with our state representatives. This is the annual legislative breakfast hosted by the Pembroke Chamber of Commerce. Every year we try to get some of the local legislators to meet with the business community, discuss mutual issues and solutions. And uh, we're thrilled that Josh Cutler, our state representative, is always here. Vinny DiMacito, uh, the new senator for this area, is here. And uh, I'm looking forward to what they have to say. I know they're looking forward to hearing what our members have to ask during the winter was the failure of the MBTA. I'm the new kid on the block and so uh, I understand that the challenges are great but I've really enjoyed the relationship and the opportunity that I've had working with the people of Pembroke. Uh, you know I think we have a lot in common you know growing up in Kingston uh, which is the neighboring community sharing you know Silver Lake I you know as a, as a Silver Lake grad um, have a lot in common with this community um, but I know that we still have a lot of work to do. I know Pembroke's dealing with some real challenges in regards to 
to um, their budget and the challenges they're facing with state aid. Uh, Josh Cutler and I just uh, put to together a letter uh, asking for, instead of a $20 per pupil on Chapter 70, which is education funding, uh, we've requested that that number go to $50 per pupil. Uh, that would be about $160,000 specifically to the town of Pembroke to help with this education budget. So, you know, we're not saying it's going to, we know that it's going to be successful, but we think we have a good case to make because communities like Pembroke and Kingston, um, many communities that really didn't get to see a real bump in education funding uh, got, you know, only got $20 per pupil, uh, which really is insignificant. Uh, if we can get it up to $50 per pupil, as I said, $160,000 to Pembroke, that's something we're going to fight for in this legislative budget coming up uh, right here in the next month and a half. We're uh, underway with our budget process, and uh, there's a lot of very positive indicators in our economy. We're seeing a lot of job growth. Our unemployment rate is actually the lowest it's been. Uh, it's 4.9 percent, lowest it's been in, in uh, a number of years. We saw more job growth in 2014 than we've had since uh, in over a decade. And uh, so there's a lot of very positive indicators. There's also some concern. Um, we've seen energy prices that are rising very fast. Uh, we have uh, uh, growth in our Medicaid and mass health costs that we need to, to bring under control. So some things to, uh, to work on, and we're getting underway this legislative session. Uh, I was proud to be uh, appointed to the uh, Telecommunications and Energy Committee, which will allow me to uh, which will allow me to uh, work on some of these issues. Also uh, trying to tackle MBTA, make sure, you know, people obviously need to be able to get to work to be able to have a vibrant economy and making sure we fix the MBTA mess is uh, really at the top of the agenda as well. So also got an exciting new build this uh, this session that I'm working on called uh, Mass Made, which is to try to um, brand and promote Massachusetts made uh, products. And so have a website that consumers could look to and know that these products were made here in Massachusetts and allow companies and small businesses to brand them with this made in mass label. So that's something we're working on to try to promote businesses here in Massachusetts. This is the fifth annual legislative breakfast. Uh, we took over uh, back in 2010 and by 2011 we thought this would be a great event uh, to get all our members together and find out what's going on on Beacon Hill that's going to impact our members and what can be done, what is being done. And it also gives a chance for our members to voice issues to our legislators that they may not even be aware of yet and try to nip it in the bud before it becomes a big issue. So a lot's going on in Beacon Hill these days. It's good to see our uh, our representatives and uh, out in the community and tell us what's going on. Yeah, I was lucky to, to go to that breakfast. And what's wonderful is you get really in-depth answers rather than just mm -hmm. sound bites. It was very interesting. Yeah, good. And now we'll switch from politics to performance. Ah. And... The folks at the Spire Center for the Arts in Plymouth ushered in the spring with the grand finale of their open mic series. Judges chose 13 contestants in total from four different open mic nights that started back in January when the snow was just starting. There was no snow this weekend, but there was plenty of great musicians showing their talents in hopes of winning a five-hour recording session and a chance to open for a national act in an upcoming tour. PCN's Brian Sullivan was there. One question that drives musicians crazy is when people ask them what they do for work, after they tell them they're musicians. Well, tonight, everyone that took the stage at the Spire was a musician. What started out on one of the first snowy nights of winter has culminated here tonight in the grand finals of the Open Mic Challenge. 13 acts on stage, and one of them will walk away the grand prize winner. My favorite night in New York was in Virginia. I love the way that she held on to my hand. Pembroke's own Matt York had two big motivations to play for. The first was his eight-year-old daughter. The other, his six-year-old daughter. Neither of them knew Dad back when he was a rock and roller in his 20s, but they were both in the audience on this night. I started playing the clubs in Boston when I was in high school. Uh, I did it up until I was about 30 years old. I met my wife uh, at a club in Worcester. Uh, and then I just kind of became an adult. And, uh, but my, you know, I've always had the music laying around and uh, my kids have always heard me playing on the couch and things like that. And uh, so I thought they'd get a kick out of coming and seeing me. You know, I don't need them out seeing me at a bar or something. So I figured we'd try it here and uh, it went well. 
All 13 acts were selected to compete in tonight's finals after making the grade in one of the four previous open mic nights. Each was playing for a chance to win a five-hour recording session at Sea Sound Studios, located downstairs at the Spire, as well as an opening slot for a national act playing there in the summer or fall. There was one artist that caught people's attention with his piano playing prowess, and that was Jamie Conway of Pembroke. I started learning when I was three years old and still learning to this day. I had a grandfather that played all kinds of piano and was a concert pianist in his younger days. And when I was very little, it got me curious and you know, I first met him and I used to do duets as a little kid and been playing ever since. In the end, there could only be one winner, and that was singer-songwriter Carlin Tripp of New Bedford. Now that he'd won, I figured I'd ask what he does for work. Work is work, and, and I, do have, I do have, you know, a legitimate job. I have, like, three legitimate jobs, <laughs> you know? So I just kind of piece it all together, and then I, I play music as often as possible, and I, you know, I look for opportunities like this, and I gig out, and I, I play as much music as I possibly can. The next job for Mr. Tripp will be putting together a solid recording session and getting ready to tour this summer. Reporting from the Spire, I'm Brian Sullivan, PAC-TV Community News. The South Shore Recycling Cooperative celebrated 16 years of service to its member towns with a Trash Bash event. They gave out awards to surrounding towns who have demonstrated decreases in overall disposed tonnage per household. There are also many displays about all the types of recycling, and PCN stopped in to see more. We did see a somewhat of a significant increase, and I think that was part of the thing where our former contractor did not factor in. Today we had about 100 guests that came to meet with several uh, of our service providers who had exhibits in the, uh, this lovely uh, venue here. We're here at um, Jones River Trading Company in Kingston. And after lunch, everybody went around and, and talked to the different service providers. Uh, and after that, we, were, uh, we gave awards to three of our best performing towns. Uh, we recognize the town of Hanson, the town of Situate, and the town of Plymouth for having the lowest amount of trash generated per household from its residents. And this is, this is a very important thing because trash is a very expensive thing and uh, so many of the materials that we use can be put to better uses than throwing it in the trash. We then had a panel discussion and we had uh, a um, regional manager from Waste Management, which handles many of our town's recyclables, and they explained how the waste stream is changing and the mix of materials they're getting in their recycling isn't always what it's what their systems are designed for and it isn't what we're supposed to be throwing into the recycling. People are getting a little confused, uh, particularly with plastic bags and food. Those things do not go into the uh, recycling containers and we're trying to find a way to uh, get that message out to uh, people who throw those kind of things into their recycling bin. And we finished up this beautiful thing with a, uh, a very funny act by comedian Jimmy Tingle uh, doing his Humor for Humanity act. So we left everybody smiling. Claire Goslomsky uh, reached out to me. She know, she's seen my shows before. I try to use humor for purposes beyond just entertainment when I can do it. So if I, I, I pay attention to what's going on in the world, I come up with material that reflects a certain point of view, and I try to make it funny. So that's kind of my role with this, with, with the event today. I was here for entertainment purposes to uh, monitor the the uh the panel that we had earlier the discussion and to keep bring some levity to it uh ask some questions keep it moving and then do a little bit of a performance so i, I love it i do them all the time and uh it's a lot of fun what i did basically is i performed uh, social and political humor about what's going on i talked about the snow i talked about alternative energy i talked about the tingle alternative energy plan and i had a lot of fun doing it i have ideas other candidates have not thought of check this out i'm talking about windmills on every traffic light in america to generate the power to run the traffic lights red yellow green red yellow green red yellow green the critics attack my ideas but mr tingle what happens if one day the wind doesn't blow i try to tell them you don't have to stop. 
So I had a lot of fun doing it. And stretched out a, a sorting station in order to be able to This summer, there will be several big name writers publishing new material, but very few are creating the same excitement as Harper Lee's sequel to To Kill a Mockingbird. For years, Harper Lee asked the public, couldn't one be enough? But the deeply loved characters such as Atticus Finch, Scout, Jem, and Dill left the American public always wanting for more. PCN went into the community to see how our local bookstores and literature educators are preparing for this highly anticipated new novel. So this new book, Ghost at a Watchman by Harper Lee, is due to hit bookstores this July. And it's a big deal because Harper Lee has um, previously only written one book, and that's To Kill a Mockingbird. And that book is pretty much loved by everybody who's read it, and pretty much everybody's read it because you read it in high school and, and then you go on and read it again and again. And the characters are beloved. So um, this manuscript was found um, that Harper Lee wrote, and it has the same characters, and it's sort of a, a sequel to what happened in, um, in To Kill a Mockingbird. So we're all waiting very um, patiently for it. We're excited. With Harper Lee's new book on the way, the literary world and the literary industry have been slightly at odds with each other. Read by Millions, To Kill a Mockingbird was more than just a bestseller at the time of its release in 1960. It helped change the way people saw their own generation. This, I, I've read this book probably 60 times, and every time I read it, I see something new. It's, it's the most, it's the most well put together book I've ever read. Every single line relates to something else. Corinne Woodworth has taught To Kill a Mockingbird to hundreds of children and has seen over the years the way the book has impacted social perception through the eyes of school students. I first taught this book in the 1980s when I was working in Norwell. Um, and it was a long time ago, I don't remember a lot about it, but uh, I think at that point the whole um, racism, segregation, the Boston busing had kind of died down. So it was, it was pretty much a straightforward literary novel. Um, the kids liked Scout, they thought it was a cute story, and, and I'm not really sure that the racism was as important as maybe it is even today. Now I think the racism part of it is even more important with the current events uh, that we're dealing with. Um, I think racism is popping up again in really bad ways. But the other part of it that um, people tend to gloss over is just the one human dealing with another human part. It, the book is so much more than just civil rights. It's just human rights and people dealing with each other. Um, and that's the message that I think is, is the most important part today. Given the status of Lee's first book being arguably one of the greatest American novels ever written, it begs the question, will Ghost at a Watchman simply be a commercial giant and miss the target with social impact? So this is great for a bookstore because it, it, it brings interest to books in general, but um, right away, right when the news came out about her new manuscript being found, the sales for it to Killing Mockingbird went up. People want to reread that. And in fact, I know a couple bookstores, I mean, um, book clubs in Duxbury who are reading um, To Kill a Mockingbird right now in preparation for the new book. I don't think the new book is going to damage her reputation because so many people love Harper Lee. So many people love To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, I'm just afraid people are going to be disappointed. I think people will be interested to see what else Harper Lee had to say. Um, I'm just hoping they'll be open-minded, not too judgmental, um, because I don't think it's going to be the equal of To Kill a Mockingbird. In my opinion, um, the overall appeal is to find out what really happened to these characters that people love so much. We get to see Scout in this new book as an adult, looking back on her life. And I think people really want to see that. The other part of the appeal, I think, also is that they're using the manuscript as it is. It's unedited. So people who are writers or interested in the writing process get to see how she put her words down on paper and how that worked. And, and that's just that's a huge gift for us all to see that. Whether you're a literature teacher, a bookseller, or simply a bookworm, go set a watchman hits bookshelves this summer. Reporting from Duxbury, I'm Maureen Bates, PAC TV Community News. And don't forget, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. This is going to be a 
a, a monumental event, and it's it's good to see what's going to happen. It's uh, you know it's 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 just a continuation. I like what she said about you know relationships between people. Right. I thought that, that that's an important thing. Right. Today, um, especially. Yep. And since everyone in high school always read this book, it was a mm -hmm. it was a must read, and the the characters were so loved. And I'm I'm looking forward to finding out if they're going to make a movie, and if so, who's going to play the part that Gregory <laughs> Peck played. Design Corner is back and just in time for some spring tips to get us in the mood for sunnier days. Okay. Hi, Sue Shockley here. Setting the Space Lead Designer. Thanks for stopping in at PCN's Design Corner, and today we're gonna to talk about spring. So I don't know about you, but it has been a long winter, and I am all done. So today, I'm gonna to invite you onto my sun porch, and we are gonna go in and have a little bit of a spring fling, maybe a cup of tea, and we're gonna talk about bringing the outdoors in. So come on with me. So here we are on the sun porch, and today I just wanna bring attention to the outdoor flowers that we've brought in. As you can see, we have some beautiful cherry blossoms. And what I wanna to say to you is, you know what? You don't have to buy everything. When you're outside, look at the branches and everything that's coming into bloom and just begin to cut and then bring them in and force bloom them and they're just beautiful. It's bringing the outdoors in and it's gonna make you so happy. So today, we're gonna to have tea together and I'm starting out with setting the table and I'm just gonna to continue to add in my layers, which I usually do with different heights, textures, color, and before you know it, it's gonna be this beautiful place setting, so come with me. So here we have our place setting, and now I'm just gonna add in just a single tulips, little cut flowers always add some beauty to the table, a little candlelight, always brings in a fresh scent, and a little bit of light always makes everybody look good. And here we have a really nice book that we can chat about later, about teas. So as we're sipping on our tea, we can even learn some. And there's nothing like sugar cubes. So let's bring in our fresh flowers. And don't be afraid to bring something in that may you might think is out, outdoors, but you can actually bring it in and it could be a conversation piece, and then you can plant it outside too, which is really good. We always talk about height, so if you have a platter, or you can always take a bowl, turn it upside down, put a plate on it, and just so that you can bring a little bit of height, and then we can place our food on it, or whatever you need to do. We're gonna have a little tea sandwiches, and our little pot of tea for two, and a little bit of Lily of the Valley. Those are usually your first blooms. And now all you need to do is make a phone call, invite that special somebody that you haven't seen all winter, put the tea kettle on, sit back, relax, and let the sun shine and enjoy the spring. Town Talk takes us to Kingston with Town Administrator Robert Fennessy. Hi, welcome back to the West Wing of, of Kingston Town Hall. Um, I just want to update the town on a few uh, situations that are going on. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that you realize that the election is on April 25th of, the, of, of 2015. So there are some interesting uh, ballot issues. Uh, we have the Board of Selectmen. We have actually three candidates running for two seats. So there'll be one on the sidelines at the end of this. Uh, Sue Munford is running as a, as a re-election candidate, Peter Bonsek and R. Lindsay Wilson. We also have a, a, an assessor, the different, I'll, I'll mention the different uh, positions that don't have a contested election. Assessor, planning board, uh, Silver Lake Regional School System. There's a vacancy for the school committee. <clears throat> The water commissioner. There is an uh, there's a contested election in the Board of Health. Joseph Kasner is running as a re-election candidate against David Kennedy. 
on the library trustees, you can vote for two, and it, there's two running, uh, Valerie Spence and Cynthia Sullivan. Uh, recreation, same thing, you can vote for two, and there's Melissa Bateman and Kathleen Lanatra. The Sewer Commissioner has a, a position that's running unopposed, as well as the Housing Authority. <clears throat> and the other thing on you'll see on the ballot this year, which might be a little different, is a question at the end of it. And it'll say, shall the town vote to have its elected treasurer become an appointed treasurer of the town? And this is part of the process uh, that the town has gone through of moving that position to an elected, to an appointed position. Also, you'll see a question on the HVAC system for the elementary school. Shall the town of Kingston be allowed to exempt from the provisions of Prop 2.5, so-called the amounts required, to pay for the bonds issued in order to pay the cost of replacing HVAC systems at the elementary school, including the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto? There'll be a funding mechanism with that. Uh, you'll, you'll get to see at the town meeting. So. Speaking of town meeting, that's the other point I want to bring up is that the annual town meeting takes place on a Saturday. It starts on a Saturday here uh, on April 11th. So, so we hope to see you there. Uh, we need to get the people to come out. Not only are you voting on a budget, but you're voting on capital expenses such as police cars and in addition to the salt shed and other things. Town meeting, there'll be articles on dredging services, there'll be articles on street acceptances, and there'll be an article on changing, doing some changes to the animal control bylaw. So these, it's probably the most purest form of government is getting to town meeting and taking part in your community. So we hope to see you there. It's again, it's Saturday, April 11th, and from the West Wing, I wish you a, a nice uh, spring. Thanks for watching the show. Replay times are listed at our website, or you can check us out on YouTube. And be sure to follow PCN on social media like Facebook and Twitter, and receive previews and links to all our stories. If you have an event coming up, it may make a great story for PCN, so email your information to kim at pactv.org, or fill out a story submission form at our website. And we'll see you next week for another episode filled with local stories from your community.